So far in Calculus 2, we've been looking at integration. We've seen a whole bunch of different integration techniques. We've seen how to deal with improper integrals. We've seen applications of integration, things like how to figure out the arc length of a curve or the surface area of a volume of revolution. But what we're going to do now is change gears completely, and we're going to move on to a new topic that's going to consume a large portion of the rest of the course, sequences and series. And in this video, we're going to introduce sequences. A sequence is a list of numbers, something like 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, you, you get the pattern. It's a ordered list in the sense that there's a, a first term, there's a second term, there's a third term. And in this course, we're generally going to think of it as being an infinite list as well, where we're not really concerned about a sequence with five terms. It's kind of boring. You're like, there's five items. You can look at them, but that's about it. The types of questions we're going to be concerned with are going to deal with infinite sequences. And there's all kinds of infinite sequences. I could have, for example, this funky thing or this funky thing and so on down the line. In fact, it doesn't even have to be a sequence where all the entries are real numbers. That's what we're going to do in this course. We're going to deal with sequences of real numbers. But beyond in mathematics, we'll often have sequences of other types of mathematical objects. Maybe sequences of functions, for instance. Uh, it's also the case that you could have sequences of different kinds of fruit or different people in our class. It doesn't really matter. But we're going to focus on sequences of numbers. Now, the notation that we use for a sequence is given by a sub n. So this a sub n is the nth term. It is the nth term inside of our sequence. So for example, if I, if I look at the first one here, the 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and so on, there's one way to just list it is that the first item is going to be 2, the second item is going to be 4, the third item is going to be 6, but I'm already getting tired of that. I want to have a general formula to do it. And in this case, I'm going to say that a n is just going to be equal to twice the value of n. So for example, if n is 3, then 2 times 3 is 6, and that's that term right there. We have that the third term is just twice times 3. We can go down the list for the next sequence, 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 quarter. I'm going to use b now because a is already being used up, but in this case, bn is just equal to 1 over n. So for example, the third term bn is just 1 third. Carrying on, I can look at this, well, the next one's kind of interesting. 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1. The first lesson is just that repeats are allowed. It doesn't have to be an infinite sequence of different numbers. I can, I can repeat them as many times as I wish. That's still allowed. Secondly, if I want to come up with a formula for it, I'm going to call the third one cn. Well, to deal with this alternating, uh, one other thing I know that alternates is minus 1 to various powers. Uh, it's not quite minus 1 to the n because if n is equal to 1, that would be minus 1. That's not right. But minus 1 to the power of n plus 1, that one works. Uh, if n is equal to 1, this is minus 1 squared. That gives you the value of 1. If n is equal to 2, this is minus 1 cubed. That gives you the value of minus 1. So it works out well. The fourth one here, which I'll refer to as dn, is the Fibonacci sequence. It's this interesting one that has this property that that any given term after the first two is just written as the sum of the previous two ones. So one thing I could do here is if, if I let d1 and, and d2, the first two terms, be equal to 1. If I look beyond those two terms, then the nth term is going to be the sum of the n minus 1th term and the n minus 2 term. So for example, if I look at 8 here, this is the sum of 5 plus 3. So that's going to be the Fibonacci sequence. And this type of, of expression that I have here is actually a recursive definition of a sequence. That's our term for it, where the, the nth term is defined recursively in terms of previous one. There is actually a closed form formula for the Fibonacci sequence, kind of like the top ones, called Binet's formula. But this is sufficient for our purposes. Finally, for the last one here, I'm not actually going to write anything down. These are just the digits of pi. I'm not claiming I have some formula for it. Uh, I'm just saying that the nth term here is the nth digit of pi. So sequences can be all kinds of things, and they don't have to even have any pattern at all. They can just be just a bunch of random numbers. It doesn't really matter. One of the most common ways to come up with new sequences 
is you take any function that you might think of, any function that we've been dealing with, like x squared or e to the x or sine x or anything like that, and then you sort of restrict the domain. And what you do is you define a n to just be the values of like f of n. So, so n are restricted to be these positive integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. So, for example, if I take a couple of the ones that I had before, I can imagine a, a larger function. I can imagine f of x here being equal to twice x. And then we have a sort of special case here, which is a n, which is going to be twice n. And indeed, this is just the same thing as f evaluated at n. Or for the second one, my function here might be f of x is equal to 1 over x, and then I'll use bn now. bn is just going to be equal to 1 over n, which is just the same thing as just plugging in n into the values of that function. We also can go the other way around. I can make up an entirely new sequence here, and I can just define an is equal to, say, I don't know, what's your favorite function? How about sine of n? And then a1 would be sine of 1, and a2 would be sine of 2, and so on down the line. We habitually use quite different notation for a function and a sequence. In particular, if we're talking about a function, the name of the variable we usually use is x. And so when I write f of x, I'm thinking of implicitly that x is a real number. When I write a sub n, I'm thinking that n is a natural number, a number like 1, 2, 3, 4. But there's something a little bit hidden in the notation, which is that a sub n is, is kind of a function itself. It's just that it's a function whose domain, whose input values are not all real numbers. It's a function whose input name are just the natural numbers and whose output can be any real number. So the difference between a function of the real numbers and a sub n, a sequence, which is just kind of like a function but of a restricted domain, is sometimes not that large. Just as we can ask the question, does the limit as x goes to infinity of a function converge, we can also ask, what happens to my sequence? If my n goes to infinity, does my sequence converge? And indeed, that is going to be one of the core problems that we're going to be interested in studying when we refer to sequences. We want to know, if I have a particular sequence, does that sequence converge or diverge? So what do I mean by convergence or divergence? This is not the most mathematically precise version that we can give, but one way to think about this intuitively is that as my n gets really large, as my n trundles off towards infinity, then the values of a n get as close as I could possibly wish to some limiting value l. And if that's the case, if my a n gets really close to l as my n values get really, really large, then I'm going to write the limit as n goes to infinity of my terms in my sequence a n the limit as n goes to infinity of my a n is equal to the value of l. To see what I mean by this, I'm going to see if I can graph a sequence that I'm going to claim converges. So, but first of all, to, to graph a sequence is just like graphing a function. It's just that when you graph a function, you have this smooth curve, or sometimes you have a smooth curve, it's a nice function. But for us, instead of filling in all the points like what is f of a half or pi or something like that, I'm only going to figure out what is an of 1, 2, 3, just the integer. So I'm going to get a dot at the value of 1. I'm going to get a dot above 2. I'm going to get a dot above 3. So if I put in some markers here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on down the line, if I'm going to imagine what a typical sequence might be, maybe it's this. I have some height at 1. I have some height at 2. I have some height at 3. I have some height at 4, I have some height at 5, and it's going to carry on. Now what I'm going to do is show you a convergent sequence. This is a sequence where it goes up and down and bounces around for some time, but eventually it gets really close to some value here, maybe I will denote this one to be equal to L. As my N gets large, my terms get as close as I wish to this value of L. Now, it might be that there's some larger function here. I can just sort of make one up. It just sort of comes along and does whatever it does. It just sort of fills in. And that these points just happen to be a restriction of this function to the natural numbers. 
So the connection between the limit of a function and the limit of a sequence is very close. We are going to say that the limit of a function converges if, as my x values get really large, my function gets close to some number like l. We're going to say that a sequence converges if, as the n values go off to infinity, then the terms in the sequence a n get really close to this value of l, which they appear to do in my example. Indeed, we can formalize this relationship between a function and a sequence and their convergence by saying that if it is the case that the limit as x goes to infinity of a function converges to l, then if the sequence is just one that comes from that function, if, if f of n is equal to the an's, then so too must it be that the limit of the an's as the n goes to infinity has to equal l.